Uh, this is Algebra 1 data team at North High School. We are working on a long form after just finishing the topic of exponential functions. Uh, we're going to start with just some thoughts about the unit and how things went. So I'm just uh, have each of you kind of just summarize what you wrote in the form. Um, I just put that this topic is really strong for my students, and I think the biggest contributor to that was the QR code activity that I did at the beginning of the topic. I think it just chunked the information, and it allowed students to see all of the information, like, from day two. So then they had, like, multiple days in class to process the information instead of only seeing, like, one type of question on one day and then another type of question on another day. Like it was all of it all the time so that they had more time to process, which I think was really successful. Um, I think students definitely improved from the first assessment to the second assessment. Assessment. Some things that I realized though were we did the videos and a lot of the students didn't like voice that they were having trouble with some of the problems until we went over the booklet. Um, so I don't know if they were just stuck in, I need to watch these videos and do the assignment and can't really ask for help. Um, but um, we kind of brought up like a new way of teaching instead of just having them watch the videos. Like Jessica had talked to a student about um, making a project for us instead. So I was wondering if that's maybe something that we should look at a little bit more. with the rest of my students that um, once they did their assignments, the scores got a lot better. Because they, the first two classes before the first assessment, they just sat down and watched the lecture and did their assignments, but then once they actually had time to finish their assignments, their scores went up a lot more. Um, and I was really happy with scores as well. I think we were all pretty happy. This was a good topic. Uh, I think all of us setting it up with a lottery question at the beginning um, really just set them up for success. And, and I was telling students through that time, like, you're learning, like, even though you don't know that you're learning, like, you're learning right now. And it was perfect because they would just take that, take that understanding from that lottery question and, like, they applied it. Like, I didn't even really do any other example, like, word problem examples. I barely did any in my class um, after that first day where we did the lottery question. So, like, that knowledge just kind of to hold them through. Um, my last day was a pretty good day. We had this uh, matching activity, which was really great, but, um, and then after the matching activity, like, students worked together, and it was a really, it was really good, but then afterwards, I had practice for them to, like, remember what the questions look like, and, like, remember how to do this stuff, and um, I didn't have a lot of success with that, because it was the end of a week, and I was doing schedule requests, and so I was distracted, and I wasn't keeping them on track, as much as I think if I would have been a little bit more like focused on making sure that they were doing that practice, I maybe would have had even scores a little bit higher, but overall I'm still happy as well. Okay. Let's take a look at the data then. Um, we went from 18% proficient to 50% proficient mm -hmm. and only had 5% of the students not pass the topic although it looks like we've still got about 14% of the kids that haven't taken it yet. Anybody want to comment on scores or... I mean, 50% has to be our highest this year, right? Probably, yeah. <laughs> Pretty good. Last year we had 26% proficient when we finished. And I just remember us being so impressed with I know. We were, we were very <laughs> happy with that last year. <laughs> Michelle, why do you think, um, I mean, that you had 0% from 1s to zeros, and, like, you had 77% as far as 3s or 4s? Um, 
Like I said, I think a big thing was from the very beginning, especially like the question that students messed up most on, the question with the parameters like A is greater than zero and B is greater than one, um, I started using that notation like right away, like from day two. It was in the QR code activity, it was in what I talked to them about in class. Um, so I think just like, I, I had them see that notation right away from the beginning so they had more days to process it and they had more days to get used to it. Um, I mean, I don't think I taught anything drastically different, I just really think that QR code activity helped them because it chunked things really well. They had somewhere to put their notes because I had my booklet and then they had somewhere to do the practice. Like there was little checks after every single video and I was going around and checking on their on their little checks for understanding. Yeah, it's really impressive. I think, yeah, that as I'm like reflecting like and I have this later on, but like that parameters question, like A is greater than zero and B is greater than one or whatever, like that was like my number one missed question still. So I know I probably should have put a little bit more emphasis and like you said, even like starting the notation earlier so that kids could just be familiar with it. Like it's not like, like with a little bit of guidance, kids were like, oh yeah, okay. But then like it just wasn't, I don't know, they didn't quite grasp it as much as I would have liked. So. All right, let's go on to uh, looking at the strengths and challenges. I kind of had the same thing too where I felt like everything was a strength, as, but then as far as a challenge would be was the graphing from parameters. Like, even though we had went over it like a day before the test again and they were like oh yeah I see it was still like this looks too difficult or I even remember um, one of the students asked like do I even have to pay attention to the 10 is less than x is greater than 10 or whatever that was and I'm like not really you know it's just telling you the dimensions of the graph so I think if, if there was anything other than I would add, um, it would pro like that that number eight question, that parameters question was by far the most missed one, but I would say if there was anything else, uh, I had kids who, like, because it was a divide, that when you were writing the equation from a table, um, kids putting three instead of one over three would probably have been my second highest mistake, but I wouldn't even say that was super common. Jessica, I think after the first one you talked about your kids not wanting to write, did that, they fix that second time around? Yeah, it was a lot easier. They knew exactly what to write, and then the question, question four, where it talked about, where we had the argument of going above, like a lot of students use keywords like going way above or going a lot higher, like making that exponential. Um, idea known in their writing. That was really good. Okay. All right. Kaylee, I'm going to scroll down and we'll be... And I guess if you just each want to reflect briefly on how you, what some of your reteaching that you did before we assessed again. Um, in between assessments, I used quizzes.com and I used Google Forms so that kids could like do an opener and get immediate feedback about whether they got the question right or wrong, which just kind of got their minds in the right spot for the day. And then um, I also did that matching activity that Kayla was talking about, which students really liked. And it was kind of one of the first times that they really made a big connection between the equation and a graph. How do I match up those two? So I think that was a really good activity for in between. And I'll just speak to that because that's mostly what I wrote about. But, um, yeah, so, like, having kids work together was really huge for that activity. Like, um, and I let them pick their groups, but I said, like, be mindful. Like, you're not going against each other. Like, you're working together. And so I think that helps some students maybe not go with their best friends necessarily, but actually pick people that would help them. Um, 
And so I, I was really impressed with the number of kids who were working together on that matching activity. Um, and the outcome, like, I told them, I will not help you. Like, I'm not going to tell you how to do this. Like, you have to talk with your group and figure out and, and you know, put the pieces together as a group. And me setting that up right away, like, kids depended on each other. And I saw even, like, lower kids who were an integral part of the, the working together because I had set it up that way and because, like, they were working together. So I was really impressed. So really enjoyed that activity. Um, going over the first assessment, um, you just went through each of the problems and then they just went to finish their assignments and then I would kind of check in with them being like, okay, where did we struggle and allowing for that open communication because I feel a lot of times they just want me to sign off on it right away. Um, and that really helped because they were like, okay, I didn't understand this part. So then I would show them and then give them more problems to work on just to kind of help with that. And when they turn in their lecture for the assignment, it's not a question of, do you have questions? Because it's an easy yes or no. It's, where are your questions? That way it forces them to think of where their questions actually are. And then um, when I handed back the first assessment, anyone who had a two or higher they were grouped together and they had to fix their tests together. And so a level two student had to work with a level four student to get their answers corrected. And then I focused on the lower students and we just went over as much as we could during that class period. And um, they found very silly mistakes that they had made and it worked really well. Okay, looking at our SMART goal then. Uh, we set a SMART goal of 23% um, proficient and we made it to 50% proficient and then as far as students that passed the unit or the topic uh, we wanted 96% and we had, oops, I guess we were right about there, 95%. <laughs> we'll call it yes. <laughs> we'll call it yes. 96% <laughs> uh, numerically we got 95%. And I'm thinking, I mean, if we were to pick up the, that 14% of the kids were missing, that would would take us over the top, I would hope. So, And I know we've talked about the reteaching strategies already. Um, how many of the kids tried the compound interest work? Um, once we talked about it a little bit, about as far as like what it meant and how the formula works, and I had a QR code that would lead them to a virtual nerd activity or a virtual nerd video, just so that they could kind of understand like the vocab and where to place the numbers and stuff. Um, kids were trying it more. I think maybe for next year, we should just completely take out the rule of 72. Like, I feel like that part that we had all kind of said wasn't really a true level four, like, was tripping kids up. Because that part, you don't change the decimal, or you don't change the percent into a decimal, then later on you do have to. And, like, the P up there stands for percent, but the P down there stands for principal. Yeah. And, like, it was just such a foreign concept that having two formulas that have P's in different ways and have percents in different ways. Especially when we weren't really thinking of that rule of 72 as anything important, maybe just taking that part out. Okay, I wrote that in at the top, so we'll have that for next year. I think that's a good connection. I'm glad you brought it up, because I only had, like, one kid ask me, like, because I didn't do as much, and this was part of my reflection of my reteaching. Like, I wish I would have actually, like, I, I exposed kids to some of the level four questions, but I didn't hit enough kids who could have done it, I think. Um, but, like those level four kids who were trying it and doing it, like, had questions just like that. Like, what does this P stand for? Or, like, what does the R stand for? Like, the R stands for interest rate. But I don't even think in the words, like, I don't know if it ever said rate. It just said, like, like interest. And so, like, there was a disconnect even within the directions and, like, mm -hmm. what the symbol stood for. So, yeah, probably cleaning that up a little bit would help. Something else I just thought of right now, like, I would like our word problems Maybe instead of always being like one half or two or three, try and get, which I noticed Jessica had some on her assignments, 
but where it's like they have three-fourths of it left, or they t ate one-fourth of it. So then having, like, forcing kids to make the connection, oh, so they have three-fourths of it left. So that would be their common ratio. Or they lost 3% of the money, so they have 0.97 left. Like, trying to force, I think that would be an easy way for us to take this obviously easier topic and kind of bump it up a notch without books still falling within the standard. Because those are more the type of questions that they're going to see in the real world anyway, with, like, percentages and stuff. Okay. Um, so, like, I added those to the to the, what we would change about assessments for next year. And so I think that... It takes care of everything for this. Okay. Uh, we're going <laughs> to... Algebra 1 data team at North High School taking a look at... Uh, CFA on solving quadratics and deciding if it matches the scale and any changes that we need to make. Um, before we start diving into it, I just want to say that like I kept it pretty short. It seems like last, like when I was looking at the original one, it was pretty short. Um, so, but we can always go back and add questions. I know, like when we get to the level three, it's pretty straight up. But So for level two, we've got zero product property and factoring. I'd like to see another ZPP on there. Like, just a... Like number one. Yeah. Okay. I can type that while we talk. Okay. So we have factoring by difference of squares, factoring by GCF and then move this negative 2x to the other side, and then I assume I'm not some product. <laughs> math, math, but some product, yeah, now that I'm doing it, some product. I'd say take out one of the factorings, because this, okay. because this topic isn't necessarily about factoring, it's about being able to solve it. Solve it. Right. So if you change one of those, take out the GCF one maybe? I'd take no. out number two. I'd take out number two. Yeah, let's do number two. Because yeah, number three okay. gives you the, the idea of the x, just the, the GCF equal to zero. Oh, true. Yeah. Yeah, and I like that too, especially because zero product property is one of the, like, one of two things that we're looking at. So just to make sure they have multiple opportunities to show that. If no, they make a small mistake. do it for three and four, but. Right. I mean, if they do questions one and two, but they skip question three and four. Then at least we have two solid pieces of evidence for that top for that point. So yep. do you do you guys want it to be like number one where it has two x minus two? Like have that coefficient for the x? I just think they could always use more practice what if, on that. What if you switch those two factors around? Just so it's a little bit different for Michelle. Um, we have x minus 6 times negative 5x plus 10 equals 0. Okay. And then the one that was at number 1 is number 2, or that one is number 2. I think she that replaced number, number two. 2. Gotcha. Okay. okay. All right, so we're good with level 2s. Okay. So in level 3, we're looking at uh, quadratic formula and taking square roots, which I don't think, I think the square roots was something we talked about. That's the new piece. On the new scale for next year. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if we should maybe take out telling them how, what to do, like kind of how we did with um, factoring. We changed it to like use the correct method. So just maybe say find the solutions. Yeah, either by square root of both sides or quadratic formula. I agree. Okay. My concern with that, like when I was writing it, was what if a kid. Like, how are we going to ensure that a kid does both? What's going to stop them from, like, 
expanding this out and then doing quadratic formula. Like that was my concern. What's going to stop them from from just doing quadratic formula for all of them? I think that could be done in your teaching. Like if you see the squared sign sort of thing, like you should probably be doing square root. And I think on an assessment, like if we teach it to say just what Cordic said, like on questions five and six, if you see that type of form, then you have to then you have to take the square root. But on an assessment, like I want to see them, I want to raise that rigor and, and have them have to remember to show us that. I'm not, I mean, how many kids would actually expand that? I mean, take the time to expand it and then throw it in the quadratic formula. Well, I mean, the only time that I might actually see that, and this is just completely hypothetical, obviously, but, like, a kid who is here for this topic, like, polynomial operations, and is like, oh, I know how to do that. Like, that's something I know how to do. So they do it, and they're like, oh, okay, now what? Like, oh, okay, now I also know quadratic formula, but maybe I missed the day. I was taking square roots, like, that would maybe be the only kind of scenario that I could see that, but. If, if we gave them to this where it just says find the solutions, had four problems, and, like, you know that the student knows how to do both of them, but they're like, how do I start the problem? Like, they come up to you during the test, how do you start it? Could you lead them? Take the square root. Do the QF. And I only anticipate that for the lower students. I think that... But if they, know, if they know how to do it, but they just look at a problem and they don't know how to start it. And I, I think if, if we give them that, that hint, that's taking away the reason why we're putting them in the same section. Mm -hmm. Like, I would either like them to be in separate sections where we straight up tell them what to do, or we all, like, agree that that's not something that we can tell them during the CFA. We can't give them the hint of which one to do. Can we do a little bit of both? Like, could we have, even if it's just one, where we tell them, do it this way, like, do one where, take the square root, do one, do the quadratic formula, now do it however... Like, especially since it is a shorter kind of test. There's only four level three questions. Is that an option? So we can kind of hit, like the kids Jessica was talking about, our lower kids who are still striving, striving to get a three. We're giving them that smaller support, that scaffold. But we're also raising the rigor for, you know, all kids. Should we, though, be giving them that big of a hint on the CFA? Or, like I was thinking, too, you could say, like, find the solutions to the following equations by taking the square root of both sides or the quadratic formula. Hint, there's two of each or something. I don't know. Or you'll use both of them. What if you put find the solutions to the, fo to the following quadratic equations by taking the square root and the quadratic formula in parentheses? You must, you must show at least one of each method. Does that work? Okay. That way, it, that way it reminds them, oh yeah, quadratic formula, oh yeah, square both sides, so they have it visually right there, but it just doesn't tell them which one. Okay, I got it ready. I'll just send it out quick, so Kayla can put it up. And then level four. How's it? Did that level four question work out better than it did last year? Nope, I still think it's ugly. I haven't redone the answer either. Oh, wait. There was a really good one that I did for that math help interview that was just like that. And it had quadratic formula and everything. I, let me see if I can find it. I actually remember, like, actually doing the problem myself, and I was like, okay, this is hard for me. <laughs> like, we're expecting our kids to do this. But I think it will what? help. Like, that problem requires area. And I think it's going to help that yeah. we're doing oh, area yeah, in our so current much. topic yeah. with that activity. Okay, so here's the new version. I haven't sent it out to everybody for a second time. It's just on Kayla's computer right now. The 
level two, I switch to question number two. So when we're scoring, as long as they have shown, as long as we see both shown, they can get a three. Okay. So even if a kid is crazy and wants to <laughs> multiply it out and then move the 81 over and then do the quadratic formula, they could in theory do that. I don't see that happening, but. Do we foresee any other problem, before we look at the level four, any other problems we would foresee in scoring for the level twos or the other? Would it be enough for 1.5 if all they can do is CCP? Like if they can only do question one and two, is that enough for a 1.5? least maybe get the greatest common factor out of there. Or, or get the greatest common factor, or, or actually move over that 2x, because it has to be equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Like, something significant from another problem. Maybe not, like, if they find a GCF, like, if they're able to factor number three, or for number four, they remember to move over that 2x, because it has to be equal to zero. Like, I want just something else. I would even say, like, if they got question one and two correct, and then they moved over that two x from, from number four, I think those are two good ideas to get a one point five. I don't think we. I agree with you. I don't think we can limit that as the only way that they can get a one point five. Because if a kid's like, well, they did number three, but they got stuck on number three, so I'm not going to try number four because it'll be harder. Kind of thing. Um, but I, I also agree that I think it should be something more than just the Z. Should we have five level two questions so that it's like give three of the five? What would or the third one be? <laughs> we can put the or difference like of squares one back in. That way it's an easier factoring one. Yeah, maybe. I like when you get two x over because equaling zero is right. Big idea. Huge. But like I said, I still, like, I don't think we can limit that as the only way that they could get a 1.5. Well, or if they factored number three, set each piece equal to zero, and then maybe they got stuck on what to do with the 4x or something. Maybe just make note of this conversation, and when we come back with our answer keys, so look at that a little bit more. <laughs> like, because I, I, I always think it's easier to have these conversations when we have the answer keys in front of us, and we can actually see what are the steps that we are expecting to see. So maybe that's just something we make sure that we talk about once we have the answer keys. Okay, so I will. I'm writing that in and typing it in, so um, let's bring answer keys back next time, and we'll, I'd like to get it, all of this stuff hashed out before we collapse score for the first time. Uh, okay, let's look at the level four then. This was the question that was on the district. There's a question that I had to figure out in order to do that interview, and it was along these same lines where they had to find the area quadratic formula, and, I, and the answer is like, what was x, and, it, and the answer was either negative x or positive x, but I can't find the problem. So, um, I'll keep looking for it. You bring it back when we look at the, at the answer thing, too. Yeah, 
for try. next for next, next <laughs> time. Yeah, yeah. Do you, I, I'll probably end up having to contact somebody out in California for it, so okay. I'll try my best. We don't have a building level CFA for this topic yet. Are we, like, what's our plan for that? Are we going to look at the answer key for it first and then build the second one, or should we build the building one and then make our answer keys? Why don't, um, let's bring questions for next time for building level as well as the answer key, and then we can have the solving part, at least the CFA is taken care of for solving. Okay. Is that all right? I mean, I would think the questions would be similar. It's just going to be a matter of deciding how many go in the level two area and what those are going to look like, um, which means we also have to find another level four. <laughs> Hopefully Jessica can find it. <laughs> uh, and then we also need to revisit the graphing quadratics CFA too. So why don't we on... Monday, look at the answer key for this one, uh, build a, a building level one, and then if we have time, look at the graphing CFA, and then we can start building a calendar time after that. Do we know who's going to do which levels? Uh, we can go ahead and I can go ahead and put that I'll in. make the level threes. Do two, <laughs> then. So Michelle, you're doing three? Michelle, you don't... No, I'll do three. You did this whole assessment. I'll do three. She'll find the level four. Chris, I can do two. How about that? Okie dokie. Christy, you got twos. Mm -hmm. Kayla, you got threes. <laughs> I know. What? I don't have to do anything for that? Well, you, you might have to type it up. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll make you type it. Also. Okay, we'll that's, send fine. that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. Anything else? Um, I would like to maybe pull up, like, because I think last time a lot of our hang-up during collab scoring was that we had talked about that assessment like a month and a half ago. And so we had forgotten that conversation that was the big thing that was holding us up in collab scoring. So even if we could just pull up the polynomials assessment and scroll through it again quick and remind ourselves of the conversations we did have, now that we're about to start that topic, so that we're all like prepared to teach it the way we talked about it, even though it's been like a month since we talked about it. Are we keeping track like when we make the suggestions and when we agree on how we're going to score it? Is that that's being documented on the agenda, right? As much as I remember that, to, that what yeah. You want me to put, is that what you want me to pull up? Pull up the I've got like the actual assessment of. Okay, and then yeah, if you can pull up the agenda, so that way we can just double check that that's so wrong. right. And I just think it was like it was so long ago that we had talked about it, and then by the time we taught it, we all had different, slight different memories of that conversation. So if we review the conversation quick, hopefully we can avoid some of that. And Kayla, I think you are supposed to be pulling up the assessment. Yeah, I'm looking through the. Oh, my bad. That's okay. <laughs> find notes we made on fact the factoring one, but I'm not finding notes on yeah, we have a lot of notes on oh, okay another thing we wrote was look at I wrote questions one and two, score the idea of expanding separately. I'm not sure what that meant. That doesn't help. So, like, when we look at the scale, I feel like there's three bullet points. There's the, like, can they do the vocab question, can they create, and can they expand the monomial? 
which follows each of those questions. Right. So should we do like two of three gets you a 1.5? You need all three to get a two. Yeah, I think that's right. So what did you say? Two yeah. out of the three bullet points gets you a 1.5. You need all three to get a two. Any other things we see that'll be um, like what do we do if like in number one part A, like negative six times a negative five, they don't make that a positive thirty X. What kind of mistake is gonna hold them back from getting that bullet point? As far as like if they had everything else right other than that? Right. That or like or if they, like, forget to put the x behind the 30. Like, they did the original x times x to get x squared, but they forget to bring the, the x and put it behind the 30 afterwards. Like, what kind of mistake is a big mistake versus a small mistake? Well, and then you'd have to look at, I mean, if they get it wrong, on, say they do a right, but then they miss 7 times 12 and b, they've shown you once, is that... I mean, as, as long as they... Is what you're trying to say, Cheryl, I think maybe I'm just reading your mind incorrectly, <laughs> but, like, <laughs> like if they can show it once, but then they make a mistake on the second one, like, that's at least some evidence that they know how to do it, but if they make the same mistake twice, then we'd have to, that would be more of a yeah. bigger mistake because yeah. they showed that they couldn't do it twice. Yeah, so I, because A is a little shorter, I get... I get the plus 30x, but then on B, um, I don't do the 7 times 12. You've shown, I've shown once, so is showing once going to be okay, or do we need to see it correct both times? <clears throat> and there's really two. There's if they do it right, it should automatically come out in standard form as well. Because are we asking, right. is expanding in that one going to be separate from standard form? Because if they used an expansion box, it might not come out in standard form. Be. And maybe those are the notes it I made the first time. It would still be the same. It would still come out in standard form. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say this is really the only... Yes, like this one, like number two is either like you get it or you don't get it. Like maybe right. the standard form they have a little bit off, but I don't even see like that's probably not the biggest deal. Number three, when they're writing it in standard form, like that again is connected back to the vocab. Like this would really like be computational mistakes up here. And I'm willing to say like if they miss one little mistake, but they're solid on everything else, that could still be a two. But like Cheryl said, like if they show the same thing wrong twice, or they have multiple small mistakes in the same question, I think that would be a bigger deal. What do you think, Jessica? If they show one, that's fine, but if they if they show the same mistake, or if they, if they mistake on question A and a mistake on question yeah. B, then I'm not okay with that. Because we, you need to pay attention to the computation, and then if they put negative 30, then wrong, it's not the right answer. So for question one, um, one mistake is okay, but not on both questions. I, I would is that what I'm that. hearing? Yeah. Okay. Jessica, that's okay. questions. I know last time we had talked as far as I can remember anyway that like question number four like if they could do that solid that was a 2.5 and then 5, 6, 7 and 8 or 5, 6, 7 was what brought them up to a 3. Um, do we even just want to go so because all of these questions go under the exact same bullet point. Like the bullet point is that they can add, subtract and multiply. And I don't know was the I don't know who did this one. I can't remember. Like, were they all the same bullet? Like, add, subtract, multiply? I copied and pasted them. Okay. Maybe.
maybe even I still have the old version or whatever, but so add, subtract, and multiply are all separate. So if they can add and subtract, but they can't multiply. I think if they if they can show like that they can subtract in this one and all they're adding and subtracting is perfect, I think that's in my eyes that's still two out of three. That would be a two point five. Okay. But like this one which is multiplying, this one which is multiplying, like still looking at it in those categories, like can you add, can you subtract, can you multiply? But also having this al alternate like Five, six, and seven questions aren't so, like, straightforward. Like, it's not right. just, like, add them. Like, you have to do a little bit more. So I could also see, like, doing all for A, B, and C for 2.5. And then if they struggle here and there on, you know, five, and five six, and seven. Which I like that having that, like, flexibility. And, like, because if they can do question four, I they can add, subtract, and multiply. They just can't do it as far as what we're asking. Like they're getting half of each bullet, right? Is that how you're thinking of it? Yeah, I, I would say so. Like they've shown good evidence for all three of the bullet points, but like you said, not to the rigor that we have on the assessment. Okay. Jessica. Christian. So we're saying, just so I can type it in right, uh, question four, if it's all correct. They can get a 2.5. And then 5, 6, and 7 would take them to that next level. Okay. If right. they did 4 A and B correct, got C wrong, but then did number 5, that could also right. be like that's Or the, other the 7, because that's multiplying. Okay. So, so really, it's if they show an adding, subtracting, and multiplying, that's all 2.5. One okay. of each of those. Or if they can do all of oh, the adding. I see, no, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So four A and B with. Five. She's saying like if okay. she like, she's saying like if they missed part C, or they made two or three mistakes in part C, but then could they make up for that in number seven? Oh yeah. I think. So essentially, we're saying there are six questions here, three out of six. Because any way you work three out of six, I think we would all come up with yeah, that would be a two point five. Because we have about equal amount of adding and subtracting as we do multiplying. Okay, so we good with that? Okay. All right, okay. so uh, next time we'll look at the solving quadratics answer key, um, revisit uh, the graph, we'll look at the graphing one, and try to write the building level CFA. Anything else? Okay, we're good.